Hi folks, uh, welcome to lecture six. Um, so today's lecture we're going to look at uh, the end of the Bretton Woods system, uh, the, um, the end of Keynesianism and uh, the, the rise of um, neoliberalism uh, and some events surrounding uh, these, these things. So this is uh, just a, an outline of the lecture. So uh, we're going to have a look at uh, the end of the Bretton Woods system, but also uh, import substitution industrialization or ISI and the crises that uh, um, those countries uh, fell into. And we're going to look at how socialism stagnated and the stagflation that ends uh, Keynesianism uh, in the 1970s. And uh, then Reagan and Thatcher's neoliberalism in the in the 80s, uh, and uh, the debt crises um, of the ISI um, uh, countries in particular. Okay, so the compromise of the Bretton Woods system was that the dollar would be convertible to gold, so as good as gold, right? At a fixed rate of $35 an ounce. Uh, so for reference, I think gold is approaching um, $3,000 an ounce uh, at the moment. But um, so the US was convertible to gold and everyone else's currency was fixed to the dollar. Uh, and what was different about this system as opposed to the, the classical liberal gold standard system was that devaluations were allowed and were actually expected as the need to manage the domestic economy uh, by increasing the, the money supply uh, uh, and spending to create employment and um, all of that would change the uh, the all of that would change the value of each currency um, relative to others. So, and the new this new system preferenced domestic concerns, whereas the classical liberal um, uh, fixed gold system required countries to ignore domestic uh, needs and to bring in austerity or you know uh, or boost maybe even um, without reference to the state of the domestic economy whereas this system expected everyone to periodically need to boost or to cool off their economies um, uh, and that would necessarily be reflected in the uh, exchange rate of their currency so uh, all of that was good Keynesian uh, economics. Um, uh, so this system, so though I should say this system of of uh, changeable exchange rates uh, that that applied to everyone except the U.S. The U.S. was still on the on a gold standard, right? And because of that that gold making was the foundation for the entire system, uh, it, it couldn't really survive a, a revaluation um, of the US currency, whereas it uh, uh, could quite easily cope with uh, revaluations of, of other currencies. So, the the US was supposed to ignore its domestic um, economy and manage its fix to gold at $35 an ounce. And this was uh, quite easy in the immediate aftermath of World War II when the US was so completely dominant. Um, its economy was uh, bigger than all of Europe combined. Um, over 35% of the world's GDP was produced by the by the US in in the decade after um, World War II. So the US was able to support the Bretton Woods system pretty easily um, because it was booming, right? Um, and there was great confidence in the value of the US dollar. It really was as good as gold. 
Three things broke the Bretton Woods fixed system. Uh, the first was the restoration of private international finance. So before the Great Depression, uh, the majority of international lending was done uh, by private individuals or, or private banks, right? not governments. Um, but the Great Depression uh, ended that, and then it was replaced with um, the Marshall Plan, really, after World War II. Um, so that massive influx of funds uh, uh, really replaced the need for um, for the World Bank to operate as a as an avenue of private lending. So, also um, the Bretton Woods countries kept very strict controls on 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 capital, on on exchanges of capital. So. Conversion was really only allowed for long-term loans or investment, um, uh, and um, and purchases of essentials. So especially when uh, while Europe and Japan were were rebuilding, they had to be very careful that they always held enough gold, uh, enough dollars. Um, to pay for vital imports and this was very difficult because the only way to get dollars was to either sell something to the US or through the Marshall Plan um, aid. So while they were rebuilding their economies were, were really exporting nothing. So dollars had to be carefully hoarded. So capital controls stopped money flowing out unless it was absolutely necessary. This is particularly important because capital controls mean that a country uh, has some independent control of its interest rates um, and can use interest rate changes to manage their economies by uh, lowering or raising them based solely on their domestic economy's needs. Um, but if capital controls are if capital controls are removed, and allowing capital to freely move quickly um, into and out of currencies, then then uh, this doesn't work. So, for example, if Germany and France have the same interest rate, but then France lowered their interest rates with the idea that it would make borrowing cheaper uh, and would boost um, investment. If, if there are no capital controls and capital is free to flee, uh, then, then lenders, so investors, would take their money out of France and move it to Germany where it could get a higher rate of return. So, so lowering your interest rates would actually cause uh, investment dollars to flow out of your country. Um, so the, the actual opposite of what you want. So in the early years of the Bretton Woods system, everyone had very strict capital controls in place, but this began to break down in 1956 uh, when the Soviet Union invaded Hungary to crush a revolt there, and uh, they were afraid that their dollar reserves uh, that were held in a US bank might be confiscated by the US. And uh, so they moved their reserves to a British bank um, to protect it, but these were dollars deposited in a in a British bank, so not converted to sterling, but kept as um, dollars. Uh, and this began to this um, uh, this this avoided the capital controls that the U.S. might put on or confiscation, right? Um, and so to avoid capital controls, businesses and banks started to uh, take deposits uh, in, started to deposit currencies in offshore banks. So you'd have, so you'd have German uh, marks deposited in a French bank uh, and vice versa. Right? And so these became to, Came to be known as euro dollars or euro francs or euro marks, right? 
Um, and so people could do business in a currency completely outside of that government's control. Uh, and what that meant was speculators could make bets against the value of a currency changing, which that kind of speculation tends to um, be self-fulfilling. Self uh, so by the late 1960s, there were hundreds of billions of dollars in other currencies deposited in, uh, in foreign banks. Um, so the euro currency market got around the capital controls of the Bretton Woods system. Uh, so, and plus there was also uh, an attack by some new liberal or neoliberal economists that believed that free movement of capital can lead to large inflows of foreign direct investment uh, into developing economies that would enable them to have higher rates of return, uh, higher rates of economic growth, uh, and to catch up uh, with the developed world quicker. Capital can. Capital restrictions, uh, it was argued, slow down this rate of catch up. So uh, these two things, uh, by, by the, the late 1970s, capital controls were either actually or practically removed, um, limiting the effective, uh, effectiveness of government policies, uh, monetary policy uh, from then on. The second thing that uh, that broke the, the Bretton Woods system was the balance of trade uh, shifted dramatically. Uh, the balance of trade for the US. In the beginning, the US was running a massive trade surplus with the entire world um, uh, after, you know, during World War II and, and uh, immediately afterwards. Um, but in 1971, the US imported more than it exported for the first time in living memory. Right? Um, so it had, a, it had a trade deficit for the first time. And the, that was a very newsworthy um, event, right? And it felt as though the US's position was in the world was slipping, right? And if this happened to any other country, they would have devalued their currency uh, to to boost their economy and to slow imports, right? To make imports more expensive and their exports cheaper. But the US was still on the gold standard, so they were required to defend the dollar and the integrity of the value of the global currency and store of value. They were expected to um, defend that. The third thing that broke the Bretton Woods uh, system was the spending the US did on two wars. Uh, the first one was the war on poverty, um, where the uh, uh, Lyndon Johnson administration, continuing FDR's New Deal, um, introduced quite sweeping changes starting in 1964, uh, where the US government began big investments in education and health and housing and 40 or so different programs aimed at reducing um, chronic poverty, um, something like 20% of um, Americans were still living in poverty uh, at that time. But the other, the other one, probably bigger, uh, much bigger, is um, the Vietnam War. Uh, the Gulf of Tonkin incident uh, that uh, justified US uh, um, involvement, or I should say the Gulf of Tonkin lie, because nothing actually happened, but it was used as a justification for ramping up um, US involvement. Uh, so the, the spending on the Vietnam War from 1964 onwards um, goes through the roof. They end up spending $141 billion in the 14 years of the war. So, the, so by the time Nixon wins power in 1968, the money supply has increased uh, dramatically in the US and because they're printing money to pay for the war, right? Pay for the soldiers, pay for the supplies, et cetera, et cetera. And so that increase in money supply has caused prices in the US to increase. 
So inflation, right? That's what inflation is. So this meant that foreigners buying U.S. goods got less and less for each dollar as prices in the U.S. rose. And all the massive reserves of dollars that the rest of the world uh, had been ha were holding because they were necessary for trade uh, and they were as good as gold, right? Suddenly those reserves were devaluing because they were buying less and less. So countries and people began to be less and less inclined to hold dollars and started exchanging them for gold at the US Treasury. So from 1961 to 1968, um, large foreign investors and, and governments really uh, cashed in $7 billion, uh, shrinking the, the US gold reserves by 40%. Uh, and state... Uh, Foreign leaders started uh, being very vocal in their criticism um, of the US uh, and its um, uh, spending, right? So, and the, the conversion of dollars to gold uh, only increased. So, in one day in March 1968, $400 million was converted to gold uh, in one day, right? So, clearly unsustainable. Now, what was supposed to happen was the US government would impose austerity by raising interest rates high enough to attract uh, dollars back to the US, um, big spending cuts and big tax increases uh, uh, to slow the economy and, and basically do everything required to drive the US into a recession um, to decrease wages and prices, uh, and decrease the money supply. Uh, and and do, do enough of that to, to maintain the um, dollars, $35 an ounce fixed rate. This is what had occurred in 1960. Um, the US Fed raised rates and drove the economy into recession in, in order to defend the, the fixed rate of the dollar. Uh, and this event happened to coincide when uh, Nixon, who was then the vice president uh, for, uh, and he was running against um, uh, JFK, John, um, John F. Kennedy, and Nixon blamed the, the recession that was brought in by the Fed uh, during the election. Uh, he lost that election very, very narrowly, and he or he blamed the the Fed for his loss, blamed the recession, and so 13 years later, Nixon is now president, and there is an election coming up in 1972, and there is no way he's going to impose the necessary austerity and recession to defend the dollar because. He believed, and probably correctly, that it, the, if there was a recession, then, then it would probably uh, lose him his re-election. So, uh, on August the 15th, 1971, Richard Nixon uh, announces to the world that the convertibility of, uh, of dollars to gold was being suspended, and he was imposing a 10% tariff on every import to the US uh, to uh, to rebalance trade. Uh, Nixon devalued the dollar by 10% relative to all other currencies. Um, then he did it again, devaluing it uh, by another 10%. Uh, the trade deficit turned around, uh, turned into a trade surplus once more. Uh, the US economy picked up, uh, unemployment dropped. So that so it really worked, but uh, the fixed rate system of uh, Bretton Woods uh, was dead. So while the Bretton Woods system was coming under strain and then collapsing, um, uh, the, the third world suffered a, a series of crises. If you remember from the last lecture, pretty well the entire third world had adopted a strategy called import substitution industrialization so ISI uh, that 
um, kept out uh, um, imports by using very high uh, tariff barriers. So ISI caused chronic problems with balance of payments though. In other words, this is where countries run out of dollars because they didn't earn any by exporting anything. And there's still, there's still lots of things that um, countries couldn't produce themselves, mainly oil. So the IMF would only loan very limited amounts. So this wasn't really a solution. Um, and after 1967, some of the better off uh, ISI countries began borrowing quite heavily uh, from private investors to pay for the necessary imports. But these had to be repaid, so this wasn't really a solution either. Um, plus, these governments ran with very large budget deficits as they gave cheap loans and tax breaks to domestic producers and had a substantial part of the economy operating as state-owned enterprises. So their tax revenue was substantially smaller than their spending. So, and that shortfall they made up with by printing money. So, um, and unfortunately, because of the generalized shortages of everything, that caused inflation, uh, which made domestic prices higher, which decreased exports more. Um, periodically, the government would be forced to acquire dollars by lifting interest rates extraordinarily high to attract foreign foreigners to deposit and this would crash the economy um, uh, quite badly and and so these isi countries were stuck in a vicious cycle of balance of payments deficits budget deficits inflation and frequent um, uh, high interest rate uh, driven recessions Brazil is a typical example. Uh, it had become a major industrialized nation by 1960. It produced almost all the final goods it consumed, but it exported less than 1% of, of this, right? Um, it had a massive car industry. Uh, all, the major, um, all the major car manufacturers had factories there. Uh, to get over the tariff barriers. But they still needed to import the fuel to, to uh, run the millions of cars that they were producing. Um, so this led to a series of balance of payment crises, which would force the government to raise interest rates really high in order to get some foreign currency. This would cause massive social unrest and eventually uh, the democratically elected government was thrown out in a military coup in 1964. This military dictatorship crushed social dissent, imposed austerity, deep recession that eventually brought the deficits and inflation under control. But uh, the lack of exports still meant that the basic problems weren't solved. Right, So um, this pattern of balance of payment crisis, inflation, social unrest, and eventually military coup uh, to quell the uh, unrest while causing a recession. Um, this was repeated all over the third world. All these ISI countries were stuck in that vicious cycle. And they all missed out on the trade boom of the Bretton Woods era. Uh, so, uh, so they were doubly um, cursed really. So the, the best they achieved was stagnation. The worst was very repressive military dictatorships. But these were, but even even at those two extremes, the, they were still uh, market economies, still capitalist economies, right? They, they, they were using market forces to, to allocate things. Uh, so the revolutionary fervor that bubble, bubbled away in the third world tended towards uh, socialist goals. This led to the US for a good portion of the Cold War to support many of these uh, quite horrible military dictatorships because the alternative seemed to be losing uh, the country to the communists. Right?
But the socialist world wasn't doing any better. The, in fact, the, the problems were very similar to ISI countries because the, the central planning um, and almost complete autarky of the Soviet system created an economy that was completely dependent on government support and protection. Inefficiencies were dramatic. Uh, any attempt to reduce the support was met with fierce uh, opposition, just like the ISI uh, countries. Uh, there was a flurry of market-based reforms in the 60s, but these these have been reversed by the 70s as independent business actors uh, um, uh, threatened the control of the, the centrally planned government. The Czechs, who had gone furthest in market reforms, were forced back to good Soviet Orthodox central planning uh, by the 1968 invasion. And the stagnating and declining living, living standards caused unrest in the Soviet Union itself, and especially in the wider bloc. And the electronic revolution that began in the 60s uh, was not replicated in the Soviet sphere. The Soviet system quickly began to fall behind in every aspect of manufacturing, except perhaps military technology, where the best and the brightest uh, young minds were funneled into um, uh, military engineering. Um, and so they were, uh, they were able to keep up in that regard. Uh, but not in anything else. And plus, this system removed all the best and brightest minds out of the, the actual economy and put them into designing missiles. Right? So it depressed um, things further in the, in the real economy. Uh, but it was perhaps uh, the Chernobyl disaster in 1986 that marked the beginning of the end for, uh, for the Soviet Union. Because suddenly even the communist elites didn't trust the system, right? Um, and Mikhail Gorbachev uh, has been quoted as saying that it was Chernobyl, not Perestroika, that were not opening, that led to the Soviet collapse. Uh, and actually, just as an aside, the the Chernobyl was if Chernobyl wasn't important in in starting the collapse of the Soviet Union, it should probably hold a place uh, in history as stopping any further development or building of newer and safer designs of nuclear fuel power stations around the world. Um, if Chernobyl hadn't happened, I, I think that nuclear power industry would have continued to uh, boom and, and um, would have replaced the incredibly, incredibly dangerous designs that they have now with completely passively safe ones that can't melt down like Chernobyl. Uh, and perhaps we would have phased out coal-fired uh, uh, coal power stations uh, by now uh, and replaced it with clean nuclear. Uh, which would have slowed the amount of carbon uh, the world was pumping into the atmosphere dramatically. Um, and it would have given us a clear path to a non-carbon economy. But as it is, nuclear power is seen as far too unsafe. Um, so dramatic um, turn of events there, I think. Sliding doors. But I digress. So the collapse of the Bretton Woods system freed all countries from uh, any restraints due to maintaining uh, their fixes to the dollar. And so all countries responded by simultaneously stimulating their economies uh, by uh, good Keynesian, uh, you know, increasing the money supply and, and um, uh, you know, uh, directly hiring people to you know, increase services and build infrastructure. So uh, the money supply grew by 40% in the US and by 70% in the UK, right? So uh, dramatic. And so the industrial economies all simultaneously boomed uh, from 1971 to 1973. And this created demand for third world raw materials. Uh, and all over the world, prices um, increased right? or, or inflation increased. 
For example, between 71 and 73, the prices of copper, rubber, and coffee more than doubled. This increase was passed on to consumers. Uh, so the price of food in the US rose by 20% in 1973, uh, for example. This boom driven inflation was happening uh, at the same time as OPEC, so the uh, Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, uh, made their move. So on, on the 6th of October 1973, Israel had been attacked by its Arab neighbors, and on um, October the 12th, Nixon responded by sending uh, $2.2 billion worth of um, uh, supplies and um, military aid to Israel in, a, in an airlift. The OPEC countries responded by cutting off oil exports from any of them to any of Israel's supporters. Right, so uh, that was the US, Canada, the UK, Japan, Netherlands, Portugal, Rhodesia, and South Africa. Um, this halted much of the economic activity in these countries pretty quickly um, uh, as as they ran out they ran out of petrol right so people responded by hoarding toilet paper and other goods so we're we're familiar with that now aren't we so um, taxi drivers in Japan protested in the streets uh, the French government imposed a maximum temperature that buildings heaters could be set to and they did spot inspections of factories and businesses and handed out fines. Uh, and so it really caused a lot of chaos um, all around the world. Prices, oil, oil um, uh, is an essential good everywhere. Right? The oil embargo ended uh, in March 1974, so it lasted less than five months. But even when it ended, uh, OPEC didn't allow prices to fall back to what they were. They they coordinated a 25% cut in production that increased the price of oil from $3 a barrel to $12 a barrel. So an increase of 400%, right? So this is the first oil shock. The, um, the, and the oil shock was responded to in every country by increasing the money supply uh, even more. Uh, further increasing inflation. Despite this, despite this good Keynesian stimulus, uh, the world plunged into the worst recession since the Great Depression. Um, the US stock market halved in value. In 1974 and 1975, industrial output decreased by 10%. Unemployment everywhere rose past levels that were in the Keynesian area thought to be impossible. Um, if if uh, Keynesian stimulus was, was used, the average inflation rate of the OECD countries was 10% uh, or above and stayed there for almost a decade. Um, two of the biggest banks in the world failed, the, the Franklin National Bank in the US and the Bankhaus uh, Hersat in West Germany. Um, the city of New York was unable to pay its bills. And so the kind of market panic that gripped the, the world in, um, in the Great Depression uh, really gripped the industrial world again. Right? Um, British coal miners went on strike in early 74. Uh, to defend um, attempts for attempts by the government because the government owned all the mines um, uh, uh, to prevent the um, the government decreasing their wages um, and that uh, and because everyone used um, coal to heat their homes and businesses it actually forced the the entire country uh, to move to a three day work week to conserve um, uh, coal supplies. Right? So um, really serious strike action uh, everywhere by unions 
to defend their, their wages against um, being decreased. So, uh, governments everywhere lost elections, right? Uh, incoming, govern incoming governments everywhere, uh, whether they were left or right, doubled down on the stimulus, right? Uh, so between 1971 and 1983, uh, the average OECD country's government spending as a percentage of GDP increased from 33 to 42%. Right, so that's a, a big increase. Uh, and the government, governments were creating millions of jobs by you know, uh, um, stimulus spending. But the industrial economies continued to experience high inflation, high unemployment and low economic growth uh, in a combination that came to be known as stagflation. Previously, in, in Keynesian um, economics, the, there, there seemed to, there was a belief in a link between inflation rate and employment. And so, um, and whereas the stagflation seemed to break uh, the link, it used to be thought that uh, the higher the inflation, um, the, uh, the lower unemployment was, right? Because inflation is really driven by wages rising and that being uh, handed on through to customers. Um, so the the idea was that, the belief was that, uh, that, that um, if you had high inflation, it must be because uh, uh, workers, you, you've, you've reached full employment and um, uh, workers are able to force up their wages um, uh, because there's a labour shortage. But here we had inflation rising and, and unemployment rising as well, right? So the, the, the Keynesian understanding of economics uh, no longer worked. A second oil shock happened in 1979 when the Iranian Revolution deposed the Shah of Iran, uh, who was a, you know, uh, a U.S.-backed uh, dictator, uh, and installed a Shiite theocracy, um, the first one, right? And oil exports from Iran decreased, and this spooked the markets, and the price of crude more than doubled to to un previously unheard of heights. $39.50 a barrel. So this is a massive shock. Right? And and actually, uh, 1979 is an important year for a few reasons. In the same year as the Iranian revolution changed Middle, Middle East politics, the nuclear power station on Three Mile Island melted down, which slowed the building of nuclear power because of safety concerns, and that made the US more dependent on Middle East oil. All right? Um, and in 1979, the siege of Mecca um, in Saudi Arabia happened where 500 Sunni extremists, uh, Wahhabi extremists, uh, who wanted to overthrow the Saudi royal family because they weren't uh, Muslim enough. Right? They took over the Grand Mosque in Mecca for two whole weeks. Uh, um, and the, the Saudi, Saudis couldn't get them out, right? That, you know, gun battles every day, but just couldn't get them out. And uh, and this made the Saudi royal family take a, a really hard right turn to appease the extremist elements in their society. Uh, so they began funding the religious community um, much more generously and uh, building... Uh, madrasas, uh, you know, uh, mosques and madrasas, schools all around the world that became uh, Al-Qaeda recruiting centres. Um, and uh, uh, the kingdom became a hard-line the theocracy um, uh, in response to the, the siege of Mecca. So, 1979, a very important year for, for a lot of uh, political and economic reasons.
But back to the stagflation story. So high inflation and high, in, high unemployment and strikes uh, continuing throughout the 70s and the normal Keynesian stimulus isn't working, right? It's increasing inflation, but, but not increasing um, employment. By 1983, the government sector jobs uh, or government sector jobs in most countries accounted for at least 20% um, of all jobs, and most were closer to 35% or more of all jobs. Um, budget deficits blew out, but, but governments were able to borrow funds cheaply as interest rates had gone negative. Um, inflation crept up higher and social unrest was everywhere. Uh, in March 1979, after a, a winter of uh, prolonged strikes um, that came to be known as the Winter of Discontent, um, the, the Labor Party lost an election to the Conservative Party that had only recently been taken over by the formerly uh, right fringe leader, uh, Margaret Thatcher. And in the US, Jimmy Carter lost public confidence as unemployment stayed high and inflation was approaching uh, 15%. Um, so uh, uh, political changes. Right? On the 6th of August 1979, uh, Jimmy Carter appoints a new head of the Federal Reserve. Uh, Paul Volcker, uh, who must have been a giant man. He looks about six foot eight or something. Um, Volcker came in with the announced intention to do whatever it took to bring down inflation. And he pushed interest rates up to 10%, then 15%, and then eventually to 20% and left them there for three years. <laughs> Uh, so this drove the US economy into a deep recession, reduced industrial output by 10%, reduced the median wage by 10%, pushed unemployment to 11%. Uh, so the, the virtual halting of credit to the economy uh, for such a prolonged time eventually forced inflation below 4%. And it's, it's stayed under that level um, for the next you know, 20 years, really, not until the, the lead up to the 2008 um, uh, financial crash did, did inflation get over 4% uh, ever again. So Paul Volcker killed inflation, but the austerity he imposed was crushing. US, US wage growth has never recovered. So the policy of um, high interest rates to, to slow inflation was adopted uh, throughout the industrialized world. The right wing government of uh, Thatcher signed on wholeheartedly. And also in the midst of the recession caused by um, uh, Volcker, Volcker's rate heights, the, the conservative Ronald Reagan win, wins the election. And Ratcher, Thatcher, uh, sorry, <laughs> Ratchet, Reagan, Thatcher, and uh, the centre-right Helmut Kohl in Germany all added uh, to the austerity of rate hikes uh, by by following an agenda that were that was very similar to uh, the liberal laissez-faire capitalism era uh, uh, before World War One. Right. So this new liberalism or neoliberalism sought to reduce the size of government dramatically by privatizing all of its market operations, uh, eliminating subsidies and tariff protections uh, to bring prices down, and cutting services and rolling back the welfare states uh, so to pay for tax cuts uh, while keeping the budget in balance, or at least that was the theoretical um, side of it. The, the role of government was seen as uh, that it should only be one of regulation. And even there, market forces were thought to be far preferable. And a focus of the plan was de deregulating all industries as much as possible. So this new liberalism, right, this new laissez-faire capitalism uh, beca became known as neoliberalism. But 
Despite preaching small government and balanced budgets, the Reagan administration uh, accelerated military spending enormously uh, at the same time as cutting the top marginal rate from 70% down to 38%. Uh, so deficits blew out. And so the, the debt to GDP ratio in the US uh, during his presidency um, doubled from 33 to 63% in the US. Um, and the, the political justification for the tax hikes was calling trickle down economics or Reaganomics, uh, where the growth the tax cut stimulus would generate would pay for the tax uh, cuts by increasing um, uh, revenue by increasing you know, the amount of jobs and the amount of taxes people are paying. Uh, so Paul Volcker was highly critical of this uh, deficit spending and of the tax cuts. Uh, he, he, was, he was really um, uh, not a believer. And so uh, Reagan removed him in, um, in 87. So the privatisation, deregulation, union busting, tax cuts and expanding deficits uh, were, were policies followed around the world as Keynesianism was replaced with a new liberal, sorry, a neoliberal um, era that started with Paul Volcker's uh, targeting inflation rather than full employment um, as Keynesians would in 79 and then added to that was the idea of um, small government uh, um, and tax cuts um, uh, added this was added by Thatcher and Reagan so this this neoliberal um, orthodoxy right this neoliberal uh, economic approach uh, has been followed pretty well um, throughout the OECD countries uh, uh, since 1979. Um, all, probably all, you could say all the way to 2008 and maybe even beyond, but uh, we'll talk about that in the next lecture. In the developing world, the ISIA uh, strategy, the import substitution strategy blew up in a series of debt and currency crises uh, throughout the 1980s. Um, driven in particular by the increase um, in the cost of oil, uh, oil being an essential good that uh, many of the ISI countries had to import. And so the we had a situation of uh, that was what's called petrodollar recycling, where the, the extra money um, that the price hikes uh, brought in for OPEC, for the OPEC countries, was more than they could spend. So they would give that, they would lend it to international bankers. And then the international bankers would lend it to the ISI countries, who would then use those um, short term loans to pay for the oil that um, the increase in price of has, has generated their need for for um, borrowing money right so we have this um, this cycle and so this cycle became known as petrodollars and was obviously not sustainable right um, on the other hand the Asian tigers borrowed this money and plowed it into factories and industries that increased their exports uh, and the dollars they earned uh, more than the extra dollars they earned in exports more than paid for the increase in um, uh, in the cost of oil, right? So, uh, so the problem really was the import substitution strategy just didn't earn them. It generated balance of payments um, problems. So, the ISI countries in Latin America and Africa. Uh, the, the, were using these cheap loans mainly to pay the interest on previous loans 
Um, so when Volcker raises the rates uh, and all the industrialized nations follow, um, this pushed rates up for the short term petrodollar loans that the ISI countries were using to stay afloat. So in the last half of uh, 1981, um, Latin America was borrowing a billion dollars a week in short term funds. Right? So, not sustainable. In August 1982, Mexico announced uh, that it could not meet its payment due dates and was halting all debt repayments until they had been renegotiated, um, uh, renegotiating a, a new payment schedule and requested a bailout in the form of more loans. Um, immediately, the cycle of short-term loans uh, to all the import substitution countries stopped. And so the loans that were worth billions of dollars uh, that would normally be rolled over every month, just like a credit card, right, uh, all became due. By the end of 1983, there were 34 countries in default who had requested bailouts from the IMF. And by 1996, there were 56 countries um, in the hands of the IMF. Uh, so the IMF would only lend small amounts in instalments to keep governments functioning. But this, these loans came with uh, very strict conditions that the, that, uh, the um, the debtors had to meet. So the neoliberal um, Washington consensus was imposed by the IMF in what were called structural adjustment uh, programs. And these, these programs imposed austerity, removed uh, all the subsidies and uh, the massive tariff barriers um, protecting their uh, their economy, privatised the enormous government sector, and deregulated the economy while cutting welfare and services, uh, and devaluing their overvalued currencies. Right? So this had the effect of causing mass unemployment as subsidised and protected firms folded, and the prices of everything everywhere went up. Uh, um, especially imports, because um, uh, their, their currency devalued. Um, uh, services and welfare payments cut drastically. State-owned enterprises that delivered essentials, such as water and sewerage and rubbish removal, and uh, you know, it, um, were all sold off, usually to foreigners, um, because they're the only ones that had any money. But uh, regardless, the new owners would uh, cut the staff numbers drastically and raise prices, right? So this is all the essentials go up, so water and sewage and you know, electricity and everything um, uh, jumps in price. So real misery um, if the IMF gets involved, right? Real a real shock therapy that is uh, very traumatic. Um, so the domestic economies suffered deep recessions as the economy was really was restructured, and and the um, the shock therapy imposed caused uh, caused a lot of suffering. But one surprising result was that all the military dictatorships um, got thrown out, and there was a wave of democratizations that were that happened all around the world. Um, uh, that were linked to, to um, these economic problems. The other result that was universal was the jettisoning, jettisoning of import substitution as an economic strategy. Another truly momentous change that happened in the neoliberal era was the collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, China had been experimenting with opening to the world market since Nixon visited in 72. And China's exports went from less than 10 billion to over 50 billion by 1988. So they, um, even the small market openings that uh, China was doing then um, 
were really paying dividends. And uh, this growth not only threatened the Soviet Union because they were they they were restrained now they they were um, military um, uh, threats to each other right on on each other's border etc. But also this growth shamed the the stagnating Soviet Union and 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 drove uh, the experimentation of Gorbachev with the policy of perestroika, which is openness. So. So Gorbachev starts to um, to experiment with uh, op market reforms and, and opening up, um, but unlike in the past um, with Czechoslovakia and Hungary and others, um, Gorbachev is unwilling to use lethal force to crush the demonstrations and rebellions uh, that this openness uh, causes, right, or allows. And the, and the rebellions and demonstrations grew and grew and ultimately a power grab by Yeltsin's uh, Russian government um, uh, led to the complete collapse of the Soviet Union. So, uh, we've covered a lot of ground really quickly. Um, I hope you found it interesting. I, I'll, I'll leave it there uh, and I'll talk to you in the next lecture.